Welcome back to another episode of History on the Hill. My name is Monique Sugimoto. I'm the archivist and local history librarian. And I'm Michelle Ferkey, uh, archivist here um, with uh, the Palos Verdes Library District. And we are in the local history center, which is at the Peninsula Center Library. Today, what we thought we would do is to go over some of the resources that we have on whaling and whale history here on the peninsula. It's pretty incredible, but we seem to have roughly about three different eras of whale history. Um, and we've got a bunch of interesting resources that we'd like to share with you today um, on that. And since I've been here, we have so many subjects that we look into, but I really haven't investigated the resources that we have here. Uh -huh. So this will be a great way to see what we have and, uh -huh. and learn more about the whaling eras. Um, it is truly amazing. Um, so one of the first eras that we have here on the peninsula, and if you've ever wondered about Portuguese Bend, um, this is actually part of the history. Um, there was a whaling station there, and we know all about the whaling station because we have this incredible book from 1914. Oh my gosh, I look know. how beautiful it is. I know, and that it even survived this long. It's one of five volumes that was created um, starting in 1914. And this is um, called, of all wonderful things, the monthly and annual reports of the Weather Service of the Palos Verdes Syndicate, July 1914 to June 1915. And it's one of the earliest resources we have um, that documents the peninsula. Um, and like its name, it was, uh, it does include a bunch of maps and weather data. Um, the man who produced this, Ford Ashman Carpenter, um, uh, set up weather stations across the, um, across the peninsula. And um, he was evaluating what the temperature, the humidity, um, the rainfall, all of that, uh, with the idea of where should we, uh, uh, where should we um, put out our population centers? Where should the factories be? And so this was kind of a reconnaissance of the entire peninsula. But the great thing about it is that it includes photographs. And one of the photographs we have is of the old whaling station. Can you see this? Oh yeah, yeah. it's absolutely it's, incredible. It's totally incredible. Um, so there's the little whaling station that is down here. It, the photograph was taken um, in 1915. Um, so it, uh, after uh, it was uh, a whaling station, people actually used to come from San Pedro um, on boat tours to take a look. And um, there was somebody, a guy named um, Portuguese Charlie, I think was his name. He used to have little fish bakes on the, on the shore and people would come from San Pedro to come over and take a look at it. Um, but we also have, in addition to that photograph, we also have a photograph of the blubber kettle um, at the old whaling stations. Um, and these are just incredible. It's described here as a heavy cast iron and of unique construction. Um, they, w in, the, in addition to that, it was one of the, there's a newspaper article <laughs> indicating that one of the blubber kettles was stolen. Oh. Um, so <laughs> it, we have this newspaper article that, and that's why we don't see the, um, the kettle um, any longer uh, down there at, um, it, out in Portuguese Bend. Um, for those of you who like to get out and about on the peninsula, there, uh, the, Palo, the Rancho de los Palos Verdes Historical Society actually put up um, a historic marker, um, which is located um, over at the entrance of the Portuguese Ben Club. There's a small little parking lot there, and right on their, um, the, the name, you know, right where the entrance is, you can take a look at the, um, at the, at the monument that's there. It's just, just really nice. Um, I don't know that many people know that it's there, but it's a great place to go and check out. It's one of our historic sites here on the peninsula. So when we're talking about whaling, what we're actually talking about is um, people who were hunting whales. Um, they, because the whales actually travel so close to the shore here on the peninsula, um, it was one of the most significant whaling stations. This was where people, the hunters, the Portuguese um, whalers stayed there, went out into, um, you know, to, off the shore, captured, killed the whale, and brought the whales back onto 
um, back onto the shore. And they used the whale, they used the blubber um, as fuel, uh, you know, in addition to other, uh, other parts of the whale being used. So that was one of the, it was one of the significant whaling stations that was along the, along the peninsula. Kind of our next um, period that kind of involves the whales or um, whales on the, on the peninsula, of course, is marine land. And marine land was such an important part of peninsula history. Um, we have a little collection of marine land materials, which includes these wonderful brochures, little maps, um, little cards from uh, you know from the time. It actually includes the restaurants, and because there were several different restaurants that were there, um, so it's really it's really quite fascinating. Um, it first opens up in 19, um, I think it's 1954, it officially opens its doors. And for those people who are architecture fans, um, Pereira Luckman um, was the original one who did it, I just have to say. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I um, didn't know that. You did. I, yeah. He is also the one that did um, the LAX. Uh, you know, who yes. was included in that. Um, we will have to do an entire show um, on on architecture, right? And you had just asked about Disneyland, and um, it is the it is the case that, um, or we have heard that here the peninsula was considered was going to be considered as one of the locations um, to locate Disneyland but it didn't come here, it went out to Anaheim um, instead, mm -hmm. which is just fascinating to me. And it seems like these kinds of, like the amusement park or showing the um, whales in, in a way that they can perform and do their thing is kind of what was happening at the time. That is, that's absolutely true. Um, that these, this idea of amusement parks and places for people to collect and gather was a really big thing happened that was going on in the 1950s. And here in LA County, of course, we've got this open space here in the peninsula that's, you know, um, mostly residential, but undeveloped. And so that was why um, they came here. Uh, in the 1950s, right? What, what happened with marine land? Like, why did it uh, stop or, or um, close? Interest, uh, interest in marine land kind of started to go down. Um, you know, it was quite popular in the beginning. Um, and then ticket sales kind of stopped. Um, it went through successive, I think, um, owners or, or promoters of it. Um, the really the terrible thing, and people who have been on the peninsula for a really long time, you know, will tell you, um, a publisher came in, purchased the area, um, said that they would not, uh, you know, um, close it, close it down. But in the dead of night, you know, apparently, uh, some of the um, um, the animals were moved to San Diego, and then the place abruptly shut down. Um, and so for those people who remember um, going to Marineland as kids, it was really um, kind of a, it was just a really sad um, way for the place to end. And then of course the site stood empty for a very long time um, uh, and, and was used for uh, shoots, you know, for films, they would, you know, uh, create sets there um, and that was used for a lot of filming. Now, of course, it's the site of Terranea, which is just fascinating, really. And are there okay. any artifacts that have been left from that era? Um, there are, and that's such a great question because um, the city of RPV, when uh, Marineland closed down, um, they actually took Bubbles, the pilot whale, which was the iconic um, symbol of marine land, and they actually put it into storage um, in the city yard. So it's in the, the Rental Palos Verde city yard. And right now there is, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people have seen it and, you know, are kind of saddened just by how Bubbles is there in the city yard. There's actually an effort underway to get Bubbles restored and also to get it installed um, at the Point Vicente Interpretive Center, um, which of course uh, is, is, is now the, the place where we have so many whale, um, you know, our next big whale connection actually. So there is that effort to try to do that there, which is amazing. So this is the story of bubbles. <laughs> I just think this is fantastic. This is Bubbles the Whale, and it goes over the story. <laughs> Oh, that's of so bubbles. nice. I, I mean, it's just incredible, really. It looks like a golden book, but yeah. I'm sure it's, yeah. It's... Who now lives at Marineland, Palos Verdes, and it goes over bubbles. That's a treasure. It is totally a treasure. Wow. Yeah. That would be so hard to find. 
So then we have bubbles in the, you know, performing. And I think there's even one where Bubbles is crying. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I will bring you some nice fish for breakfast and teach you some games to play. <laughs> and then Bubbles, but Bubbles was sad and lonely and she didn't eat her breakfast and she didn't eat her lunch and she didn't eat her supper. Bubbles didn't eat anything for nine days. Then one day, Jake the diver <laughs> patted her shiny black head and said, Bubbles, please eat your breakfast. And then she just started working. So again, very of the period. Very of the period, yeah. It can be a little controversial, but yeah. again, this is what it was like then. Right. Even with the vocabulary that's in the yeah. little book. Yeah. And then it ends. Now Bubbles and Squirt smile all the time as they play their games together at Marineland. <laughs> Here's the menu from the Galley West. So, let so me. this really looks like it's just a common, uh, that it's been donations over the years That's from right. residents that <clears throat> That's right. is just now all put together into one collection. That's right. So people will, and I even have a couple of plates, like, uh, you know, commemorative little mm -hmm. plates that people have donated. And, you know, it's not the records of Marine Land, um, but it is, you know, artifacts and materials that people have donated to us over the years. So here is the Galley West luncheon menu where you could get beef and bread for two fifty, <laughs> or a Reuben sandwich for a buck ninety-five. There we go. <laughs> That's a seafood yeah. casserole. That's yeah, and a seafood casserole and a shrimper. And in that one, Michelle, um, there's actually a really interesting... Um, <clears throat> oh, yeah, probably, probably you wouldn't eat now. Um, but there's also in that one, the I love the, um, like the area maps uh -huh. of this one. Um, let, me, let me see if I can find it, because it's just... Here's a Marineland fun card, uh -huh. um, a little match, matches from Marineland. Here's the information sheet and schedule of events where it actually shows, um, you know, the map of the area and the daily events. I mean, this is just good stuff. Um, let's see, hold on a second. These are just kind of copies of it. But these other brochures, Ah, this is the one I really wanted yeah. to show you. This one here, Marineland oh, of the yeah, of the Pacific, colors. where it's you know the little booklet of it, where it shows you know you get some nice aerial photographs and it gives the history of Marineland. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the interesting things that happened to me on this, um, I had uh, somebody call me from Vancouver. She was a um, um, a history student working on her master's degree and she found our collection guide on Marineland, flew down here for a research trip and just and looked through our collection. She was doing research on oceanariums and couldn't believe what we had in our oh, collection, which yeah. was just amazing. Yeah. That is fabulous to hear. Good job, P V. <laughs> yes, that's what we have. There we oh, go. That's the Baja Reef. Yeah. That's the Baja Reef, yep. And again, so over time you, you get to see the different parts of, of marine land. Wow, that's yeah. Yeah. Don't remember it at all. Here is promotional materials and postcards. <clears throat> so here's another. Like these are detachable snapshots wow. of you know of them. So actually, you know, at that time. Let's see. Here we go. This is kind of the iconic one. Mm -hmm. This picture here, wearing the hat. Actually, that must be Bubbles. Look, isn't this the same hat as the hat in the picture? I mean, in the in the mm -hmm. storybook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is these. This is a collection of postcards from Marineland. I love this. Where, um, I, <clears throat> I'd have to look in. Um, I know that I, I have that. It's a yellow. It's been, it was sitting on my cart for years, and then I finally did something with it. Uh, I, I have to find it. Okay. <clears throat> okay. There we go. Okay. Yep. How about marine? What about that one? Jumping through the. Oh wow! The fire. With the fire. 
so this is one of the, um, the great things about archives. Now we mentioned that um, there was an Easter sunrise that was done over at Marine Land. We didn't find it in our Marine Land collection because it was not created by Marine Land. So we have to have a way of looking at this. It was actually Easter sunrise service that was sponsored by St. Paul's Lutheran Church of Palos Verdes. So while it was done at Marine Land, it was created by St. Paul's Lutheran Church. So we have it, the poster, in St. Paul's Lutheran Church. Mm -hmm. um, so this can be confusing to people sometimes. Right. Um, because it's like, well, why isn't everything about Marine Land in just the Marine Land box? Well, um, you know, we have to honor who was the original creator of the materials. And in this case, it was St. Paul's Lutheran Church. And even a newspaper article um, that actually shows, um, you know, the people who are sitting uh, in the auditorium or in the, in the, what do you call this thing? The stadium um, with the pool in front. Also um, is that there are reunions of former Marine Land employees and workers. And Terranea um, has actually been um, partaking in that and really wanting to make sure that the history of Marine Land is maintained and, um, and is preserved. So they have, they've helped um, in that respect. And I know the last um, reunion, or I know of a reunion, uh, that, a Marine Land reunion that occurred at the Admiral Ritzy, which of course is no longer um, here. Um, and that was just um, really special the, to have the, you know, to have those people, uh, former Marine Land employees, you know, collect and, and remember Marine Land. Uh, you know, it really is when we're talking about remembering and preserving history. It's really our people's recollections, these artifacts, these, you know, little brochures, um, their stories uh, that make, that really do preserve the history. And I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. And it's one aspect of it, right? There's yeah. the part that where people really have their memories and, and we, that was here for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then people may look and it's a little bit controversial mm -hmm. now because yeah. things have changed. Yeah. Um, but part of that is telling all the different stories mm -hmm. that are involved as they evolve over time. As they evolve, exactly, that's exactly right. And yeah. so that's why we love what we do. <laughs> yes. We started a project here um, called Your Story is the Peninsula Story, and it, in which people can um, uh, bring their photographs, we scan them, and we put them on our digital repository for everybody to, to see. Kind of getting back to this idea of your photographs, what's important to you as a resident, as a former resident, is what makes our, our story. And I cannot tell you how many times people have brought in photographs of Marine Land. Um, one of them was a, you know, a photograph of somebody who had their birthday party at Marine Land. Um, somebody who came in and there was the old Marine Land Tower and he remembers staying at the Marine Land Motel. So there was actually even, you know, a motel <laughs> right next to Marine Land. Oh, and so he's a photograph of him um, inside that. Kind of the third big, um, you know, a part of the history of whaling, of course, um, takes place at the Point Vicente Interpretive Center, um, which uh, starts in the, the mid 80s. Um, and b again, because whales are coming so close to the shore, it becomes a place uh, to do whale watching. And it's also a place that the American Cetacean Society decides to start doing their the whale census um, every year, which is extraordinary. Um, I've come and I've gone to the um, to the whale, uh, you know, to, to, to look at them when they're doing the census, which is what, from December to, I think, about March or so, March. Um, and it's extraordinary. Have you ever been? I have not. Oh, you have got to go. We'll, go, we'll go. We'll yeah. go together. Um, because what's really neat about it is when they're, you have the spotters who are looking through the, um, through the field glasses, there are posts in front um, you know, on, on the on the edge of the cliff. So you'll hear a spotter say, uh, whale out at number 22 or whatever it is, so that everybody who is there watching can actually look at number 22 to see where um, the whale, you know, can, w where the spotting is. And it's, it's truly extraordinary when you see the, um, you know, the, the fluke and the, the spray coming up. It's really um, an amazing, an, an amazing Oh, piece. that sounds, it sounds like a date because <laughs> it is totally yeah, a date. being from the Northwest, yeah. you know, uh, we spent a lot of time in the San Juans. And so we would just see, you know, every so often we would see a whale or some of the other 
wildlife, but yeah. it would be really nice to be able to, to see it in that context. Um, you can, um, and you're close by, so there's also whaling ships or whaling um, boats that you can um, pay to go on out of San Pedro. Um, and you just come close into the shore to see them. It's really just uh, amazing that we have whales so close. Mm -hmm. And to walk on the trail right there um, next to Point Vicente Interpretive Center and just sit on a bench and say, oh wait, there's a whale out there. I, it just blows my mind um, that that can actually be, be done. Um, one of the um, special things also about the Point Vicente Interpretive Center is Los Serenos um, and all of the work that they do um, to, you know, to, to preserve the history, also to document the history of whaling. And um, Diana McIntyre, um, I know that she's retired right now, um, but she uh, used to bring her, uh, her students, her class of docents here into the local history center. Um, to, to find what resources we had so that the docents can produce their research papers. So as you know, they have to have a, a research paper or a project um, to be a docent. And we actually have a full run um, of the docent papers, which are just extraordinary. You know, you can come and look at a subject heading, um, you know, abalone, it's, they're, they're such varied topics. Abalone, um, Annie Stand, you know, from you know, bald eagles. Uh, so people who are doing research can come in and, and take a look at uh, take a look at this. Like some of the you know some of the interesting it, there's lots of different ones that are here. Um, you know birds, uh, birds of prey, red-tailed hawks, kelp. That's another really big thing um, that you know, here with the peninsula. And in fact, that um, the book that we were just looking at mm -hmm. um, even documented. Um, how important the kelp beds were here on the peninsula, and how um, and how important that was um, um, to the uh, as a potential source of income. Um, of course, the kelp beds had their own little history, and we can do another episode on the kelp beds um, because they were uh, destroyed, and there was a, uh, an effort to bring them back. Oh, yeah. and there was an effort to bring oh, them back. That sounds yeah. great. Um, but you know, we just have uh, landslides, Portuguese Bend. Um, the ranchos, reptiles, White Point. Um, and then you were saying that the docents have come in to utilize the uh -huh. local history center. Yeah. Uh, um, what about um, students? Oh, that's that a great one. So um, about this time, we get our uh, the third grade local history project. So the, the third grade is when um, in California education code, um, kids have to do a topic on local history. And so we get those students coming in and using the PVIC docent papers, oh, nice. um, which is really nice because they'll, you know, they're able to, they're, they're nicely written um, and they're short or, you know, they vary in length, but um, they're totally appropriate for the third grade for the third graders um, to come in and take a look at it. And it's not just the third graders, by the way. I use it all the time if I just need to kind of center myself and get a, a quick review of what, the, um, you know, of what the topic is that I'm researching. So these are excellent um, mm -hmm. when we, you know, when we want to, you know, get a, get a topic. And then they really um, coincide with the uh, clipping files That's right. that we have and uh -huh. some of the other resources that are here in, right. in the center. So Michelle, one of her projects right now, I know she's going to hate me for this, uh, but her first project was to actually create an index of all of our subject files. Mm -hmm. So Michelle knows the subject files um, in our clippings because um, she's actually gone through them. Um, why don't you talk about uh, the Point Vicente one? Because oh. it has actually whale of a day. Yes, it does. Well, what's kind of funny, I mean, it has um, all sorts of um, brochures from uh, you know, from the 80s up to present. Um, but we, as an archivist <laughs> looking at that, we kind of smiled because it has a coffee stain from whenever anybody did that. And of course, we don't like to have any, we don't like to have any drinks because in 50 years or 100 years, that will be the area that will start to disintegrate. And, and um, so I kind of <laughs> laughed, but you know, it, it, it fa it's fabulous. And this one's from 1999. Um, and then also just seeing over the years how the center uh, was interpreted and, or, you know, exactly, you know, there's trends in the 
ways that are, think, uh, information is presented. Mm -hmm. And so that's really kind of fun to be able to look at and see what they did in the 80s and the 90s and, and now. Mm -hmm. the, the, over time, that's yeah. what you do is over time, um, you know, what is the, what was the area like and what did you do? Um, with this one from the 1999 Whale of a Day brochure. So people who are going to Whale of the Day uh, um, this year, make sure you hold on to one of those brochures and you can drop it off here and we will put it in our folder. <laughs> You can help us collect. You can help us collect um, um, the materials here, um, but you know there's a little map. There's you know what's happening on the north lawn, the front lawn, around the trees. Um, there's lots of people doing exhibits. So this is really fun. Um, you know it, it documents the um, the whale of the day with the bake sale. You know food court. Um, organizational uh, education organizational exhibits, and uh, it's just incredible that this is continuing. That um, that we have that. So could, can we just say that yeah. I, I, though I'm a resident on the peninsula since 1998, um, I have not been to the whale of the day. So this year I will go and Michelle, why don't we go together <laughs> and good. we can um, learn all about whale of the day and experience it ourselves on April the 9th. On April the 9th um, 2022. You know, we collect a lot of things here um, in the local history center, um, you know, from the old books, clippings files, the docent papers. We have a full run of, um, you know, of these uh, social review and the reviews. This one is actually a, a, about um, Diana McIntyre. But it's by looking through all of these different resources that together we can pull to, we can pull together um, various histories on topics. And this, I think, um, the, the general topic on whales and whaling, um, I think, really gets at that. Um, we can really, uh, you know, we've, we we can see all of the different instances that um, you know whales whaling occurs. But just in this little small room, uh, we're able to do that, don't right. you think? And you know, I've been doing some research on the surfing yes. club, the Palsbury Surfing Club, and it just makes me think about those guys in the late 1920s and the 1930s, and they're, um, you know, they're doing surfing on their canoes, or they're doing surfing on w when the surfboard came mm -hmm. uh, to the mainland, and they would have been there yes. when the whales are coming, you know, on their migration, and and so. That, that's been kind of fun for me just to be thinking about as you've been talking about all this information. Oh, how neat. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And one topic will lead to the next. Yeah. Next exactly. time we might have to do surfing. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. We hope you have um, learned a little bit and we look forward to seeing you at Whale of the Day um, or here in the Local History Center. Thanks again.